Greetings across whatever you listen to podcasts on. This is the Silent Film Music Podcast with Ben Modell. It's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of someone as they prepare for, perform, and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent films. I'm your host, Ben Modell, and I'm a silent film accompanist, composer, historian, presenter, and a home video label under Crank Productions. We're recording this in the middle of July 2023. It's episode 59 the one you've been waiting for (laughs) and uh that chuckle you're hearing is from my partner in crime co-host and (laughs) co-producer on the podcast kerr lockhart hi ben i hope you're getting the break in the heat that we're getting here down here in maryland um no (laughs) but uh, no um, all right i'm about uh, in a couple days i'm uh we're flying to san francisco for the san francisco silent film festival and i hear that it's about 25 degrees colder (laughs) yeah take your winter coats i my first time in san francisco as a innocent easterner was on the fourth of july weekend and we nearly froze to death yeah (laughs) yeah we've been we've been warned that at some point in the late afternoon the fog rolls in and the temperature drops. So uh, we're walking, we're running around in you know speedos and tank tops here in New York City, but we're it's 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 back to April and March weather. So that's July, and it's getting Julyer every year. Well, we I just want to note that we have just passed through the tenth uh, anniversary of Undercrank Productions, which we mark from the release of the first accidentally preserved. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, it's very gratifying to see uh, the amount of uh, what they call earned press that you yeah. got. I know you earned it by uh, setting a lot of uh, interviews and meetings up with people, but they did follow up. And it's very gratifying, the very kind things they say about, uh, about Under Crank and the films that it's brought to people. Yeah, I, I was really uh, uh, honored and, and really moved by the response from everybody. So many of the people who interviewed me uh, and wrote up the anniversary, as well as in some cases the Raymond Griffith release, were people who I'd known and, and been reviewing our our releases for many, many years. And so they kind of already knew what the, what the big news was and the big deal was. And I was just thrilled that they went along with the idea that having been at it for 10 years and putting out 28 releases about to be 29 was was uh, something to to throw confetti uh over so really grateful for everything from classic images to cineast to blogs like silentology and out of the past and uh, beth accomando having me on her podcast and phil hall and and michael gebert and i'm sure there's about four other people uh, i'm forgetting but uh, what was really exciting for me is that uh, as much as the sale on the surface you know looks like an idea to sell a lot of product which of course is a general idea but it's really an opportunity to get these unknown gems out to the people who were really interested in them by reminding them that they're there and making it easier on the pocketbook or the wallet or the money clip to pick up a few of these things and making an event out of it. So I've seen the sales numbers and it does it's not really important what, what the numbers are, but uh, I'm just thrilled that so many more people are going to get to enjoy Douglas McLean and discover Alice Howell and uh, marvel at the, the creative comedy gifts of Marcel Perez and, and, and everything else that's in the catalog. So, as you mentioned, as we record this, you're on your way out to San Francisco. I believe you said it was the first time at this festival. Yes, yes, it's my it's my first time. So, if if you think you've heard me there, and many people do, this will be my first time attending. <laughs> uh, this is this will be the first time uh, where Donald Sosin is actually out of the country, and and I'm going to get, <laughs> I'll be there, and he'll come back. From his his dates and be and be complimented on his playing in San on Francisco. It's usually the reverse. Did. I had a <laughs> number of interviews earlier this year where oh I saw you I've heard you many times in San Francisco and Portononi know that that uh, was Donald. Um, uh, but it's it we we have we have fun with that. And somewhere I the last time I. Uh, Donald and I crossed paths at I think it was in in January during MoMA's To Save and Project Festival, 
uh, we passed almost like ships in the night at the back of Titus 2 Auditorium. I said, hold it. <laughs> Somebody here, I handed Mana my camera and my phone. I said, take a picture of the two of us just so if anybody has a confusion, we don't look alike <laughs> at all. So, yeah, this is my first time going out. And, uh, I'm but really not your happy. first time uh, accompanying uh Edward Everett Horton. No, no, I, uh, not not the first time. Uh, which, although one of the shorts is one I've not played for in, in a theatrical setting. So, oh. uh, so uh, yeah, they they picked Vacation Waves as one of the three films. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, they're running um, No Publicity, uh, Horse Shy, and Vacation Waves. I think that's right. And so the other, the first two, I, I I've done a number of times because they're on. Uh, those those two, as well as uh, Dad's Choice and Find the King, are on uh, the playlist of great of you know, our top choices that Steve and I, Steve Massa and I have. But Vacation Waves is a real crowd pleaser. You get to see Eddie do a lot of physical comedy stuff, trying trying to fish off of a boat and falling into the water and and all sorts of fun things like that. So you know, getting ready for this, I I don't have to rehearse a lot or. Uh, look through music, but I do review my main theme. So I at least have that anchor to come back to a few times during the film. And so for Horse Shy, I know exactly what, what that is because it's so, my main theme for it is, is sort of a, a riff on the the bugle call that's that's played at at, at horse races. Mm-hmm. And then uh, no publicity. I had to I had to listen to it. <laughs> the recording just to see what it is at the beginning and then vacation waves uh, like i said i've i've recorded the score but i've never played for it so i had to remind myself uh what i what i what i had recorded so i've got that in my head and i'll probably jot some notes down but uh, something may happen during the show that that uh will occur to me as being even better than what i had Plan. It's not like anyone's going to be upset that I didn't play what's on the DVD. <laughs> uh, I hope, but uh, I'm I'm thrilled that they picked the films. Uh, every year I pitch a, a few of the things that we have out, and uh, it may very well be that Horton's a, a known quantity to some degree, and the DVD did win last year at the Cinema Retrovato uh, DVD Awards. So. We have that as well. And now I can change my answer that I always have to give when people ask me, oh, have you ever played at the Castro? And it's always, no, I haven't. But now it will be, yes, I have. Now I see that the uh, the festival has observed your own rule of three two-wheelers is just about yeah, as much a, as people can take. Is that, yeah. Was that their initiative or yeah. yours? Yeah, that was their that was their idea. They, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Anita Manga, who I actually, I she and her husband came to the festival in Tromsø several years ago. So I, had, we've actually met. Uh, she, yeah, she wrote to me a few months ago when they had uh, solidified their choices and said we'd like to show these three films. And uh, I said that that's great. I, I haven't. I know most of the programming for the festival are features. I know there's. I know they're showing a program of the newly restored Laurel and Hardy 1927 comedies, and I didn't look to see if that was three or four of them or not. But uh, three is plenty. I, I just keep testing it. And while it feels a hair short, it doesn't feel as long as four does. And with when when Steve, Steve and I, we do, if there's four of them, we'll put a break in the middle. Not an intermission, but a lights up break. Just a little palate cleanser for the brain so that you can take in four stories, especially if they're somewhat similar. So that's a part of the element is that it is four storylines. Because I'm thinking you can show an audience the, a super jewel production that runs more than two hours and everybody can make it through. But there's something about sort of stopping and restarting. Uh, and, and, and is it maybe also is comedy more tiring for the audience? Well, I, I don't know if it's more tiring for the audience, but it's still X number of stories. And this is, mm-hmm. I had the same thing. I've played for programs of, of serial chapters. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's just me or if I'm also sensing the audience, but somewhere when the fourth one gets going, you can feel this, ah, oh, one more. And in me, I may be just reading the room wrong or, or, or I don't know, but it's, it's my... Uh, programming sensibility i think that's important it's, and i feel like what uh, as a presenter of films that you want the show to be really good and and i think that the old leave them wanting more uh, adage is is great you feel uh, obligated sometimes well we have all these people gathered here we should show them as much as possible 
And in the earlier years of the Silent Clowns film series, there would be five two reelers, and that's just uh, it's it's just more than you know uh, an audience can take in at once. And we started putting in breaks and then moving back down down to four. You know, it's not the running time. Uh, if you're programming from the st- standpoint of what I want to show people and how long is it, uh, it's easy to think, oh well, it's you know it's eighty minutes. I mean, most features are two hours. We can run four or five shorts, but it really is the number of of stories being told and and also being crafted musically. Yeah, no, three three is three is three is good. And and uh, if if you want to see more Edward Everett Horton, you can take out your phone when you go to the lobby, uh, and 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 buy the, the set of all eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, nice. You have the nice website now you don't have to carry your copies everywhere i think yeah. when i first met you um you were, were never without a box of dvds yeah yeah and uh also uh you know we're still as we slowly come out of whatever this you know through this period of this i don't know if we can call it post pandemic or endemic or whatever as we as we as we slowly slog our way through whatever we're we're going through now merch sales are still a hit or miss. Mm-hmm. Uh, some places, like at Capital Fest up in Rome, New York, where I'll be in August, uh, I find that product definitely moves. At some other places, I'll bring, like at the Kansas Island Film Festival, I shipped two boxes of product, and uh, at least half of it, if not more, got shipped back. And maybe it's because everybody already has all my stuff, or I- I'm not really sure what it was, but it, it, anybody in the music industry, selling T-shirts and CDs and vinyl or whatever, I think we're all finding that merch is still slowly picking back up. I- initially, nobody wanted to touch things that other people had touched and and touch money and that sort of thing. And I, I totally get that. I sure. did a show in, uh, at the South Dakota State University at their big concert hall, concert hall a couple of years ago. And the week prior, Joshua Bell had done an event there. And, you know, no autographs, no merch. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody's being really super careful about that. It's 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 That's changing. But be, because I, especially now that uh, uh, I'm distributing through a company called Alliance Entertainment instead of with CreateSpace or whatever, it, uh, where all my product was only on Amazon and only on the U.S. Amazon. My 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 releases are on Deep Discount, Critics Choice, Movies Unlimited, Wow HD for people overseas, et cetera, et cetera. And you really can just go any place to to uh, order something after after a show. Uh, there may be a merch table. I, I know off, often the uh, Rena Keen. Uh, from the Nile Silent Film Museum uh, may have something, but I don't think I don't know if they have anything official I as far you, as merch at the San Francisco Festival. One of these days, I think uh, you know you're going to have to print up some logo T-shirts. I've toyed with the idea <laughs> of doing of, of doing that. Uh, I I did. I think it was Jordan Young, who's a, a, a historian and writer of a number of books. Uh, he's got a great book on the making of the crowd and. Uh, yes. he, he reviewed, yeah, and he wrote to me uh, or he posted something somewhere that he had sat down with a friend of his and wa- they watched the Raymond Griffith release and the, his friend said, my gosh, this is, excuse me for, for saying, patting myself on the back like this, but he said, oh, this is like something Kevin, Kevin Brownlow would do. And I jokingly said, oh, maybe I should start wearing a baseball cap at, at every, <laughs> at every event. And I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. So, um, uh, I'm not nine thousand percent happy with how it looks, but I went to Vistaprint because they do baseball caps with the, where it's you know sewn in and had a couple of undercrank baseball caps made up. So <laughs> I'll have that and a blazer and you know sunglasses. I'll look like Kendall Roy a little bit, and hopefully nobody <laughs> will tell me to f off <laughs> in the middle so, of everything. To badly paraphrase you, you've described your job as a companist as bringing the audience to the film. Not so much of the world of the film, but world of silent film itself. Like coming yeah. to this universe, is there a particular uh, task for an Edward Everett Horton short that is unique to to those subjects? Um, I'm not really sure. They're so well made. You know, they don't need a lot of help. They just need you know to keep the the mood going and mm-hmm. and, and and just follow the gags a, mm-hmm. a lot of the time. There's no nothing really special i mean there are some gags here and there in some of the films where being ahead of the audience but on the same at the same point that the film is is useful so the beginning of scrambled weddings 
Um, we have a, an introductory title card. We meet Eddie, and then there's uh, this uh, this moment where his butler comes in and sees his, uh, Eddie's friend on the floor, thinking he's dead. And so the music has to be on the side of the re- the reality that the butler thinks, because mm-hmm. that's the gag. That's the setup for the gag. So you play, uh oh, and then as uh, Eddie picks up his friend and realizes what's actually happening. And, and again, I wait until Eddie realizes it and then slowly uh, shift into, oh, he's not dead. It's this. I'm not going to spoil it. Mm-hmm. But pretty pretty much um, there's no, there's nothing special that they, they, they really need. It's just, you know, they're, they're, these films are made uh, by Harold Lloyd's staff, produced by Lloyd. And, and so you, you, you know you're in good hands uh, from the moment you see the Paramount Mountain fade into the main title card. Actually. And, yeah, you yeah. O- you opened the door to something uh, kind of a large subject um, I wanted to touch on, but uh, what the heck? It's the door is open. I'm going to go through. Uh-huh. Um, you cited a, ca- a specific case um, where what you're doing is presenting a character's point of view rather than being the um, being the omniscient presenter of here is the film, here's the opening titles. This is the kind of film that you uh, can anticipate, and here's the first scene, and look, look, you know, this is how it looks. And yeah. I'm telling you very objective things, but as you're going into it, you you might adopt a point of view from time to time. Yeah, yeah, to to not so much to help the gag, but, but to be on the inside of the gag. Mm-hmm. So it, it's uh, another example would be. One of the you know one of the things that Lloyd and his his crew like to do is that we would start on a medium shot of something you think it's this, and then you pull back and it's oh, actually yeah. that. So the opening, uh, the first time we see Harold uh, in Grandma's Boy, we think he's cranking a car trying to get it started up, and we pull back and we see he's running operating an ice cream maker. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a moment where in uh, oh I think it's for heaven's sake where we think. Uh, Jobina and Harold are on a beach uh, by the water. We pull back and it's a construction site. Well, so you, you know, don't play just... the punchline. You play the romantic moment and then gradually ease your way into not a musical rim shot to say, hey, we fooled you. But <laughs> the idea is, you know, that the music has to match the setup. You don't have to do that, but it helps. They've worked so hard to pull off this gag. Mm-hmm. You might as well get on the... This is This is... You know, one of the things I, I I like to talk about with, especially with comedies, but I think it plays it applies to dra- uh, dramas as well. Is if you understand the viewpoint and the style of the director or the leading uh, comedian, uh, you know where, where the gag is going. So it, it's like uh, uh, any any time Charlie Chaplin sits down at a table with Albert Austin and maybe one other person, and this there are gags about indigestion and table manners. I'll, I'll usually play a uh, a light waltz because that's what he would do. But it's it, it 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 gets the point of the satire of table manners and uh, and so and all this stuff that, that Chaplin is. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, th- that's that that that's kind of his mindset. So mm-hmm. the music, whether I'm playing it anything that sounds like he wrote it or not, uh, you want to help uh, enhance and optimize the the material. But in in the same way, you could say the same thing with the Griffith film or or Stroheim or Fairbanks they all have they have a point of view they're trying to get across well I was going to say it might you know particularly come in where a hero is um, deluded I mean I'm thinking of James Murray in the crowd uh-huh. who sort of doesn't ever really understand um, his own situation yeah uh, and, and that you know there's a gap between his his understanding and reality and, and uh, yeah it seems like music could get in that space. Yeah, something I did the first time I ever played for the crowd back in college, and I still do this, is that moment after the accident. And if you haven't seen the crowd, I'm not going to tell you what it is. But there's this moment where he's just devastated and he's freaking out. And we cross cut from James Murray out in the street and sirens and fire trucks and newspaper boys and police and crowds back and forth and what do you do uh do you play the noise do you play his sorrow and anguish anguish or and then one of the things i remember lee Irwin told me you know when i was starting out is a lot of times when there's cross cutting you pick one side mm-hmm. as opposed to going back and forth back and forth i mean if you you can i suppose 
do that, but it means you have to really rehearse the hell out of it. Mm. But in this case, what I do with the crowd is I stay on his anguish and not Mm -hmm. a big screaming Franz Waxman, you know, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this pensive, you look at his face, this pensive, you know, his world is is just completely uh, been undermined and and hold on on that while we cross cut to fire trucks and and crowds of people um back and forth back and forth so that the audience is identifying with his emotional state as opposed to processing sadness now a lot of noise in that sadness and a lot of noise and, and, and that's they can another see way of going the, you know they can see the fire trucks well right you don't, you you don't do, have to show those you know you, this isn't a it is. It can be an opportunity for an organist to work the toy counter, um, <laughs> but I think that doing something uh, mournful and pensive, uh, a la Bernard Herrmann, all the way through, you know, it, it's it's like that sequence in Vertigo where Jimmy Stewart for two minutes or so is just driving around San Francisco looking at things, and there's just that that t- uh, tango vamp, yeah, and uh, and we can see what what he's worried about and concerned, but instead of playing all the action and what's obvious on screen and mirroring it to to hold back a little bit. So that, that's a, something It's a I'll chord do. with just an internal tension. So as well, long yeah. as <laughs> he's repeating that chord, you're going to feel that, that tension. Yeah, and then you put in a two-bar ba- two vamp to hold for a second and then move on. But but that's something I, I've always done with with uh, the crowd. And it's interesting you mentioned that because there, there are a lot of things where his, yeah, his character... And so much of that film is about what's going on in his mind. Mm-hmm. It's a very uh, interior you, film, and that's kind of why mm-hmm. I jumped on it. Yeah, and it's very easy to play uh, weird, uh, uh, tinkly, uh, whole tone scale stuff when <laughs> he's trying to do his work and the numbers are spinning around in his head and you see that on screen. But we can see, like you said, you know, we can see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we need to mirror that or do we uh, musically... Uh, mirror uh, his emotional state and let let the audiences and their right brain fuse the visuals with his face and the music it, it's, it's a pro it's an approach we're going to show you this you're going to hear this and then you as a, an audience member put the two things together to get the thing i'm trying to express mm-hmm. and it's the same thing that uh, you know it's that's the core of soviet montage which they kind of borrowed from some of Griffith's techniques. I'm going to cut to this. I'm going to cut to this. I'm going to cut to this, and you're going to get an impression that is this. Mm-hmm. So, it's, but it's 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 about creating an an emotional or psychological state in the audience member, as opposed to showing the audience that you're playing the piano and, and making a lot of noise or something. So you brought it up in passing, but the most recent release from Undercrank Productions is the Tom Mix. Double feature, Sky High, and The Big Diamond Robbery. What impelled you to do this? This is sort of a new direction. We've been doing a lot of comedy. We've been bringing the Alice Howells and the Marcel Perez's to uh, viewers, but uh, this is one of the biggest stars of the period. So what took you there? What took me there was a very long list of films that are at the Library of Congress that are preserved and in the public domain and which do not have any donor restrictions. And donor restrictions means that the person or the company where that particular print came from, uh, you have to ask their permission or pay to access it. Uh, So uh, Rob Stone compiled this list for me. Uh, Rob Stone is a moving image curator at the Library of Congress and is the, my main connection there for all of my home video releases for the last eight or nine years. And we were both looking for things that, like any of my other projects, are things that should be available but aren't. Mm-hmm. And I was looking through the list and this and that, oh, that's missing a rail. This is, oh, Sky High with Tom Mix. And I just a, a little bell went off and I, I just thought, that's weird. I am that's got to be somebody's you know, that has to be I'm sure that's out and no not Kino Lorber and Flickr Alley or Criterion I thought wow Tom Mix I wonder if there's it's only five reels I wonder if there's anything else and I sc- go through the lists you know searching for Tom Mix and there's one other <laughs> uh, film in the collection that's complete that, that is a Tom Mix film and I started going just researching you know, that's where I came up with this number that he made 83 feature films. His films are not available. 
his face and his films should be as well known as Doug Fairbanks's and Buster Keaton's. Everybody knows his name, no one's seen his films. So he's he's got this great uh, charisma and screen presence, and you can see if you if you get to see a Tom Mix film in a theater, uh, especially you get to, you see what what. A, why he was so darn popular. Yeah. The, I think part of the other interest in this is I knew I had a really good shot at getting these licensed to Turner Classic movies. Mm-hmm. Having accompanied a program of Tom Mix films at the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival in 2019 that was hosted uh, by and introduced by Scott McGee from TCM and Ann Mora from MoMA, that place was packed and it just went over really well. I know that Tom, uh, Scott is a huge Tom Mix fan. And so... Um, when I was pitching things to Tur- Charlie Tabish, and I mentioned Tom Mix, and I didn't even have to explain which films they were <laughs> or what the <laughs> plot lines were. That was just, oh yeah, we'll take the Tom Mix films. Sky High makes a lot of uh, hay, as it were, in its own title about being one of the first feature lengths to be shot uh, in the Grand Canyon. And yeah. at first, it's not that quite that remarkable because the monochromatic film is not giving you the feeling. But as the film develops and as they really use the location in a very dynamic way, they're not just a background, but they really use the Grand Canyon in the storytelling. It's I'd say at least half of the film is shot on location at the Grand Canyon. And when you realize that all the stunts and the chasing and the climbing up and down and climbing up ropes and all that stuff, none of it's doubled in the studio. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's Tom Mix and the, and, and, and everybody you, else you see at his the face. Grand Canyon. Yeah. yeah. It's, when he does a stunt, you see his face and you even see the leading lady's face too. He'll grab her. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> yeah. And there's there's a moment toward the end of the whole the whole fight and the chase in the Grand in the Grand Canyon where Crystal Cutty was able to find a uh, continuity that indicated the film's original tinting and toning. And so that that sequence takes place at dusk and so we have a mix of, of shots of of the leading lady Eva Novak and that's just plain uh, pink tint but then the stuff with Tom Mix and the bad guy fighting it's a mix of uh, a combination of uh, a light pink tint and either blue tone or blue gray tone uh, so uh, tinting makes the white areas that color and toning makes the dark and black areas that color so you have this dual color and then wherever it overlaps and it, it it's a, it's an interesting uh, uh, effect uh, trying to simulate dust dusk yeah. so we we did that we put that back in digitally although uh, Gary Locher uh, who who found the nitrate in the early 70s uh, let me know that that, that 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 print was in fact tinted. It was just it was preserved in black and white. So you're you're seeing the majesty of of the Grand Canyon in the early early twenties. I don't know that it looks that much different. I I you know you always think of that uh, that PSA that Bob and Ray did. You know, Please stop <laughs> throwing things into the Grand Canyon. Yeah. It's the only canyon we have, but it will cease to be so if people <laughs> keep throwing things into it. You're watching and you're realizing that in 1921-22, a lot of people had had seen postcards of the Grand Canyon. And to make a film with Tom Mix, where half of it's on location, it must have been really exciting. No, I think the tourism infrastructure hadn't really been built yet, so it looks much rawer than it yeah. does today. I know I've heard you several, several times saying the big diamond robbery... Uh, Mm -hmm. Nobody's seen it since 1929. It is of that unfortunate class, the last year of silence that probably became the most obscure because they were so quickly pushed aside for movies with synchronized sound. Yeah. The result is it's unbelievably crisp and clear. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's it's a really, you know, we talk about things that sparkle. It, that, that movie really pops. And yeah, that one is I mean, untinted, so it's you know your classic nitrate yeah. look. I mean, the reason it looks that good is that you know when you start with thirty-five millimeter preservation, and in this case we were using a, a preservation done by the Library of Congress of a, a, an American release print combined with a nitrate thirty-five millimeter print in the collection of lobster films, which the Library of Congress scanned, and it has French titles, so there was a huge 
I mean, a huge part of the restoration project, in addition to stabilization and cleanup, and then the eventual grading was, you know, swapping out the titles all the way through. Visually, it looks fantastic. It's not Sunrise. It's not Metropolis. Uh, it's not the big parade. It's a good film. Uh, I've seen reviews uh, from its uh, initial release saying it's really like three two reelers, which it is. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there are a couple of moments where you go, I guess this is wrapping up. Oh, it's not. <laughs> uh, but it does keep moving. And Tom Mix is one of those people like like Doug Fairbanks. You see him and ah, I'm going on the ride with him. I don't care if this looks like it's wrapped up already. And now we're on to some other uh, other chapter. Uh, I'll I'll just keep I'll just keep following along. So well, as we've said with so many other undercrank titles, uh, this isn't uh, homework. Uh, it's not medicine. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to wash some, wash it down with something that tastes better. Um, yeah. this is the entertainment that that people lined up for and went to see most of the year while they're you know while they're waiting for the one or two Fairbanks pictures a year. It's you yeah. know they invented tent poles in 1920. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the difference between a tent pole picture and a, and a program picture, and there's nothing wrong with a program picture. You can you can have nearly as much fun, and that's you know that's really what we're we're talking about is what did people go and see and what did they enjoy? Yeah, and and because silent westerns really haven't been paid attention to in the same way, thought it was worth at least with Tom Mix getting this out. There are not a lot of complete Tom Mix features that survive in different archives. There are a bunch. And hopefully this will be a jumping off point for other archives to release or make available their Tom Mix films. And for folks who program art houses or cine conventions to run more of them. I know MoMA has restored a couple of their Tom Mix holdings because they have a lot of stuff from, from Fox in the hopes that people will get to see him and his, his face becomes more well known, and then I'll, I'll I'll probably go back to other comedies at at some point. But uh, it's it's just, gosh, why do, you know we should everybody should know what a Tom Mix picture is, and mm-hmm. that that was the real impetus uh, behind m- making these available. All right, Ben, a few more uh, sort of general questions about silent film accompaniment that we often don't go into because we've got news or we've got we've got a specific clip to listen to. So we kind of have run past some of these things. Now, you mentioned something to me about uh, your decision when you're going to play a date, uh, whether or not to take your uh, the take a music light. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure my my colleagues all have this in their back pocket, but it's something that I think a lot of people don't take into account. I know because a lot of times when I get to a venue, uh, I will say, do you have a light? And then uh, one eyebrow will, or both of them will go up, oh, there are some theaters I play where there's a lighting grid and how big of a baby spot do you want and how bright and and that kind of thing can be worked out. But uh, I've gone through a few lights myself and I've worked with a number of them. and, And you really just... Even if it's if you just need to see the keys, you just need something simple. Just learned to bring my own light. The one I like to bring is one called the it's made it's called little lit light L I T T L I T E. They come uh, either with a clip or a, a weighted stand. But a lot of times, if you walk past theaters in the back and you see uh, a mixing board or a lighting board and a a long goose black gooseneck light uh, that looks like the the, the top of the the Martian ships in War of the Worlds in, in the in the 1950s movie. That's a lit light. And they, those things are also made that you can stick them into a mixing board. Uh, but they have a dimmer. And I, I like the ones with the incandescent bulb because uh, for some reason their LED bulb models, uh, the, as they get darker, they, they switch over into a red. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't work for me. It's great if I'm mixing a show, but it doesn't do me any, any good. I discovered that uh, music lights that have LED bulbs, I don't know why, but they sp- the light spills out mm-hmm. uh, too much. I, I, re- I remember when I was playing for City Lights in, in Norway, and we had the full orchestra in the orchestra pit, and the back row of the orchestra with their backs up against the stage is the horn section, 
And they had their music lights on, as, as did the rest of the orchestra. And Tim Brock noticed that the b- bottom third of the screen kind of looked washed out. Mm. And it, was, it wasn't it was the projection. It's just that we all they all had, I think there's a, a, a popular brand called Mighty Bright, which is fine if you're down in a pit and it's covered or something, but they do spill. So uh, I'd love to save electricity and use uh, <laughs> the LED ones, and they, they run on a, on a battery. But they're, that's, a, that's a concern I've, I've had with them. But, uh, but it's important... And that you need a specific light that doesn't spill over where you can control the light pattern and it's it's how bright it is. Uh, I had a light once where somebody came up to me, an older person at moment, and came up to me and said, I have cataracts and can you turn that down because I'm getting this glare off of the piano. And it hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, uh, it, it just it took a number uh, of years and just learning to bring bring my own light uh, anywhere and in, in so that I'm I'm ready and I, I have something that'll that'll work for, for me and and if if the the venue has you know a huge lighting grid and and all that stuff can get wor- worked out in the lighting booth that's another story but I presume theater organs tend to have lights yes they they typically do sometimes you have to hit them a little depending on how old the instrument is or I, you know, they, I there's know a separate a, switch you know as a keyboard player. Yeah. You can somewhat manage in the dark if you don't have to read music, but I don't know what I would do if I had to find a stop. <laughs> yeah, that, the, that's important. And, I, and every, every every once in a while, you get to an organ and the the, the light for the pedals isn't working. Lovely. Or there isn't, or there isn't a light on the pedals, so you have to bring your own. I think uh, in in uh, at the venue in in Topeka. I think Marvin Falwell brings a light and clamps it on, so so the pedals are lit. So I thought, I remember coming the first time. I thought, ah, you thought of that too. Uh, so you just, I mean, every instrument uh, me, me is a, is a little different, but it's just a practical reality of what what goes into your kit bag uh, when 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 going going to a show. It's just it's just that and and having an extension cord, because that's another thing. Mm. Along with shows where a DVD or Blu-ray is being played back, if you're playing a DVD. It'll of course be stretched out because nobody knows how. It could, then you have to find the remote to right. change the projector oh, setting. Oh, to get the yes. Yeah, the where's the remote? Ratio. Where? Yeah, then you find the remote and uh, are there batteries? And it looks fine to me. And no, it doesn't. And so uh, it's it's one of those uh, one the, of the one of those things. Yeah. By the but, way, dear uh, audience, we, if you have a, one of the older undercrank titles with uh, cubes, uh, hold oh, on yes. to them because the cubes are gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I realize that most people have sixteen nine televisions at this point mm-hmm. and don't know how to f- f- you know fum for their way through their remote. And at this point, um, if you've got a, f- a four three tube television and you really like it and are not going to change it, that I'm I'm so I'm sorry. But uh, there are more people with the widescreen televisions who just want to pop the disc in and not have to f- fuss with it. So. I did that for a while, but I, I think it's oh, so and, you're and also it native uh, at four native sixteen nine and yeah. in it's pillar boxed mm-hmm. and purists will tell you that the resolution isn't as good because it's being squeezed and this and that. I I don't know you can't please everybody <laughs> but I want to make it easier or easiest for the largest number of fans who buy the disc and put it in and chances are they've got a widescreen TV. I'm lucky if they've got a player at this point. Yeah, I, I just made a decision at one point and also it meant, uh, it made it easier for me to author both formats, Blu-ray and DVD. If it's the, all the menus are the same size mm. and uh, the the video is pillar boxed, it's the tw- it's the 2020s and, and uh, I, I get it. I get it that, that uh, some people have the equipment they have and are not up for replacing it it's kind of like waiting you know i'll replace the fridge when it stops working you know i don't need to get an upgrade on my fridge or my toaster oven i'll wait for it to stop working recently you've had the experience and i think this is a really good for someone who is as uh, reflective as you are to play two performances of the same film in this case safety last by harold lloyd Two uh, in rapid succession and uh, kind of were, well, the effect on different audiences and particularly uh, how you build. I mean, this is a film which what what's this film about? This film is about the last 25 minutes. Um, yeah. I have literally shown it in school for instructional purposes to demonstrate the ethos of the 20s and just simply started with the climb. 
Um, uh-huh. But you, we want you had a, a a take on on how you build that climb musically. Well, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm still playing with it. I, I played for it twice in the last month, and I'm going to play for it again up at the Strand Theater in Scroon Lake, New York. That's in the Adirondacks, where I've done something uh, every summer except for COVID for the last several years. What I'm playing with is just the climb itself. I mean, the first half of the film sets up, raises the stakes and raises the stakes and raises the stakes uh, so that when Limpy Bill tells Harold, yeah, you just go up one flight and I'll meet you. I'll meet you up there. (laughs) Harold goes, all right. And then it's the challenge of is is that for the next, I don't know how many minutes it is, but it's just tension and release, Mm -hmm. tension and release, tension and release. And the audience is having a great time. Mm-hmm. It's a little harder for the musician. There isn't a, a sweeping arc of emotions. It's it's kind of like playing for for serials for, for for twenty or thirty minutes. Uh, and so I've I've tried different things just for myself, playing music that's sort of heroic in between things, and uh, as as he starts off on onto the next level and then you have more tension and and agitato uh, and terror to play with uh i tried something the last show i I did a a last week at the jacob burns film center where uh the thing with the pigeons i never know what to do Mm -hmm. i mean the audience i can hear they're laughing i just like for me uh i i know i've tried something that's a little uh, a little more upper register, mm-hmm. uh, but still, but th- with still some energy and in 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 a minor key. I mean, because all it is is it's just birds landing on him. Mm-hmm. Then more birds land on him. Then more birds land on him. And then he thinks he's okay. Then more birds land on him. <laughs> and, and there's more birds that land on him. And then he, he you know he pops the bag and they go away. It's like tapping you know musically. It's kind of like just tapping somebody on their sh- on the shoulder over and over and over and over and over, and then mm-hmm. they say, "Would you stop?" And that's it. But the I mean, this is the, the the brilliance of the film is it's so well constructed based on the audience reaction. So uh, anything that I do is probably go- is going to be fine. But I I'm just trying to find there are a couple of films that I get to play more often than others where. Like the general, mm-hmm. where I, I, from the audience is having a great time. I'm just trying to find new levels for me uh, mm-hmm. to to like, like we were talking about uh, on another episode about um, battle scenes mm-hmm. that, that 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 need a, a different kind of musical structure. Um, but the, you know, the film, the build, the building climb just works the way it works, and it you know builds in uh, you know. When the mouse goes up his leg and he starts hopping up and down, the, it's always the same reaction. I'll record the show in Scroon Lake, uh, and ideally we'll, we'll get to hear some of that. But this is just something that, that it's a journey that I'm on. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, the film isn't working here. <laughs> but uh, some of the Lloyd pictures are, are, are like this, where for the musician, it's a different experience uh, the way the middle of Speedy is. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, somebody every once in a while when I'll talk to somebody about Lee Irwin and, and they'll say, oh, I heard Lee Irwin said he doesn't like didn't like to play for Harold Lloyd films. And that isn't what he said. He talked to me about the exact same thing is that from where we're sitting as as accompanists, it's it's a different kind of trajectory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the gags, the gags themselves are brilliant. They're executedly fantastically the whole sequence is just there i mean i I always say this that the the films are just they're constructed like roller coaster rides Mm -hmm. but uh for for, from where we're sitting it's 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 you know x number of minutes of tension and release tension and release so it's not a knock on the film because like like i said that that's the thing that i uh have a greater appreciation for with the Lloyd films every it's especially the ones with the lengthy gag sequences that that don't really advance the plot Mm -hmm. uh, is how well they work with an audience regardless of of the music and it's just I'm trying to find maybe I think I'm just seeing if there isn't an even better way that I can score the sequence uh, so it works even even better and I feel it's even more satisfying for me Mm mm-hmm Actually, I've been tr- something I've been trying with safety last has been interesting. The sequence when he goes into the jewelry shop mm-hmm. and the jeweler is wringing his hands, and he's a Jewish stereotype. 
And what I have been doing the last two or three shows I've played of Safety Last, for that whole sequence, what I used to do is play something that was maybe a little more characteristic because we see it's, you know, what's what's going on. And then I would move into a waltz for the sequence where Lloyd is imagining the, the plate of food and then he thinks of something and then the coffee cup disappears and it fits into a waltz. So what I've started doing is I start the waltz as soon as he enters the jewelry, the, you know, the, the, the jeweler's son pulls him into the jewelry shop. What I've noticed, and, and maybe it's just the times and maybe it's something I'm doing, but by playing a waltz underneath uh, and having it sort of go with the hand ringing mm. so, the, so that we're just thinking about that, this, this physical business that Harold gets ca- caught up in and not the fact that it's some stereotype Jewish gesture. When I've talked to people after the show, it used to be people would say, oh, that's that, oh, 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 that stereotype Jewish character. Oh, it's so, you know, it really bothered me. And that hasn't happened the last couple of shows. Hmm. And I don't know if I'm helping it or if we're all like, okay, it's an old movie or, or whatever it is. But that's something that I, I've been trying because it's there. It's in the movie. It's, it's, if, it's uncomfortable to look at mm-hmm. and and to see. And it is and it's something that came, you know, from the people who were in that trade had poor circulation. Mm. So that's I, that's somebody explained that to me. And so that's what where the hand wringing comes oh. from. But still, even if you don't know that there are these ethnic stereotype tropes that are in so many silent films. So to sort of undermine it, if you will, I've been trying that. And uh, I'll, I'll keep doing it and see if somebody has a, uh, there, there's a different reaction. Get on my email list. Silentfilmmusic.com is the website to go to. I will send out an email every couple of weeks and you'll get it and you can print it out and stick it on your fridge. Uh, <laughs> and while you're the, at the, it, uh, please go yeah. to wherever you downloaded this. Uh, whatever uh, platform and uh, rate and review it so that uh, other people who might like it will find it more rapidly that's the yes exactly it's the best way to get help get the word out this has been episode 59 of the silent film music podcast with ben modell it's the podcast that takes you inside the mind of someone as they prepare for perform and reflect upon performances of live musical accompaniments to silent films. I'm your host, Ben Modell. I'm a silent film accompanist, composer, historian, presenter, and the Undercrank Productions home video label. I'm so glad uh, you listened in. Thank you, Kerr, for keeping me on schedule, keeping the podcast going, uh, and keeping it out uh, uh, for everyone uh, every every month. Who'd think there'd be so much to say about this so-called dead art form? We, we, yeah. we keep finding things to say about it. As, as, as it turns out. Uh, thanks uh, for, for everything, Kerr. Thanks for listening. And until next time, I'll see you at the silence. Hi, it's Kerr again. And since you've been such a good listener, waiting for this episode to finally drop and listening all the way through here to the end, you're going to get a special treat. And that is Ben's performance of our new theme for this silent film music podcast. We think it's a considerable improvement over those old Keystone Cops, and I hope you enjoy it. You'll be hearing at the beginning of episode 60 next time we meet.